We will call this meeting to order. Good evening, everybody. So staff has asked me to make a special request that when you speak, you, and I should probably model this behavior, um, speak right into the microphone because huh? apparently there have been some trouble hearing us when we're talking. So if you can just be sure tonight to pull your microphone forward or uh, grab one from next door, that would be great. So tonight, uh, the, as you saw, you all received a copy of the report from the financial investigative team or the FIT team. Uh, and the report is significant. It's long, it's a lot of great work, and we want to make sure to have time to digest it. So we're not going to go over that in detail tonight because I want everyone on the committee to have the time to do that. What we are going to do tonight is spend some time debriefing so that we can uh, learn about the process and get some input and thoughts, feedback, and insights from some of the participants. So I've asked Ken Beeson to kick off. So he's going to spend uh, 10 minutes telling us about kind of his perspective on the process and what we accomplished. And then uh, Jen Bell is going to represent uh, as a community member from the perspective of some community members on the FIT team. And then we'll go into three-minute rounds for other budget committee members who were on the FIT team to share insights and feedback. Uh, and then we'll go to any questions in the time that remains. And after that, we will go into a discussion of the non-general funds. So Ken, why don't you kick us off? OK. Uh, Laura asked me to spend some time giving you all an overview of what we did in the FIT process. I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what we did uh, a little bit about who was involved, um, the, the process, uh, kind of summarize the material that we reviewed, and uh, maybe a couple of my own conclusions about what I think we accomplished. Uh, the FIT was a, uh, I think as you know, is a group of budget committee members and people from uh, our community that were brought together to review potential budget. You can't hear. Is that what that was? Okay. Uh, to review potential budget solutions and to do that in a kind of standardized matrix format and uh, also suggest kind of standardized uh, descriptions. Our focus was on fact finding or on being as objective as possible and uh, trying to emphasize financial impact of these various budget solutions, particularly as they might apply to fiscal year 15 process. Uh, we didn't evaluate any of these solutions uh, in terms of being a good or bad idea. We didn't uh, make, we tried our best to steer clear from making uh, recommendations, uh, which, which we did. Uh, the members, the members of the FIT, I want to uh, call them out or acknowledge them. Councilors uh, Brown and Evans were on the group. Uh, Citizen Budget Committee members were myself, Chelsea Clinton, and Marshall Wildey. Uh, community members included John Borofsky, uh, Jen Bell, Barb Bellamy, uh, Rob Bennett, Ruth Demler, Marilyn Milney, Ken Newback, Eric Richardson, Evangelina Sungrans. Uh, city staff was Sue Cutzo George, uh, included Sue Cutzo George and Christy Hammett, Hammett uh, who provided, I think, kind of the leadership for the process. There were numerous other city staff involved in this process putting it together, and as I kind of described that. And I, I, uh, I guess along with others, would want to say thanks to everybody involved in this because there was a lot of work involved and uh, a lot of work done under fairly short time frames. Uh, in general, what we did in terms of process, we met five times and reviewed in uh, detail a uh, comprehensive list of these budget solutions. I'm going to talk about those a little bit. And they are contained in this uh, handout that was put in front of you here tonight. Uh, the origins of this list were previous discussions of this committee, budget committee. <coughs> they also included potential solutions that were raised in uh, the spring budget process by uh, the community and uh, included quite a, quite a bit of input. Um, the items that are reviewed in this particular report are, um, they're all organized by categories. And uh, to give you an idea of what's in there, I want to touch a little bit on these categories. There were seven categories, and in each category we had a number of different budget solutions. Um, 
we covered personnel costs. And uh, I'll just mention a couple of things that were in each one of these. But in personnel costs, we looked at uh, the idea of decreasing manager line staff ratio, uh, reducing or eliminating overtime, eliminating vacant positions, things like that. Uh, we looked at a category called expand existing revenues. In there, we looked at city service user fees, room taxes, uh, franchise fees. We looked at a category called grow the economy or the tax base. And in there, we looked at things like Annex River Road, Santa Clara, develop the e-website, terminate the urban, uh, the uh, urban uh, um, renewal. renewal districts, thanks, and eliminate MUPTI. Uh, we looked at reserves and fund balances. We looked at reducing the reserve for the revenue shortfall fund. We looked at the creation of a lapse fund. We talked about that. Uh, repurposing the facility reserve. Uh, we looked at a category we called other funds. Included in there was parking funds, uh, fleet funds, the telecom funds. We looked at uh, some other financial ideas that had surfaced. Uh, we looked at uh, increasing uh, purchasing or contracting partnerships. Uh, a service consolidation between agencies, uh, creation of special districts. And finally, we looked at something we called additional service reductions, and it was kind of a catch-all area of sorts and included things like reducing meeting supports to boards and commissions or reducing newsletters, uh, eliminating leaf collection, uh, eliminating the enforcement of the bag ban, uh, eliminating the green building program. Uh, all of these, again, were things that had surfaced in past discussion, and the idea for this group was to go through them in some detail in an organized way and, uh, and, and, and describe them and, and determine their applicability to the budget process. What, what we did, uh, our, our basic process, was the staff for each one of these uh, that's in there, and you can get an idea of them in the table of contents, but for each one of these staff prepared a standard description summary. And uh, these summaries are all contained in the document, uh, but they, we looked at basically the description, how it might help the FY15 budget, any potential benefits and drawbacks, uh, any long-term or any indirect implications. Uh, they provided a brief presentation then on each item, and then the FIT group spent time uh, discussing, asking questions, uh, until such time that I think you could say we collectively agreed that we were ready to complete the matrix. Uh, the matrix, and there are the matrices are in here. Uh, we looked at uh, basically uh, savings to the general fund. Could, the, could it be put in place for FY15? Is it legal? Who needs to take action? Is that the manager? Is it the council? Is it the uh, state legislature? Uh, can we save money with it without reducing <coughs> services? Um, does it have any other cost impacts in the budget? And I, I think I can say, uh, in my mind, this matrix process and completion was usually done by consensus. And uh, the results, with all the descriptions and the matrix evaluations, are here in the report. So. Uh, what did what did we what did we accomplish? Um, I found I found is that for me as we finished this process up, and I began to kind of look at what it was that had been done and digest digested. Um, I I I feel like it's a pretty impressive document. I think it's a pretty impressive piece of work. Uh, it's it's objective. It's intended to be factual information about each potential budget solution. It's organized in the way that I've, I've described, and it's provided uh, for a couple of purposes, I think. One is for, the, for this group, for the budget committee to use over the next several months as the fiscal year 15 budget is, uh, is, is formulated. I think it. I think in this sense, it provides a pretty comprehensive uh, resource document or foundation document that describes all these potential solutions. So, as as these solutions are talked about or or brought forward, uh, or the, the proposals are made by any one of us or made by others in the community. I think the document 
the way that it's structured uh, provides with us with kind of a common foundation to have that discussion, kind of a common starting place. Um, I think the review process that we went through, the staff overview, uh, the group question and answer discussion, the expressed opinions that, that happened, uh, allowed, uh, when I look at it in hindsight, allowed for us all to review all of these items in considerable detail. And I think all of us at the table ended up with quite a bit better and uh, richer understanding of each one of these items uh, and their relative, uh, relative applicability or feasibility, if you will, for use in this, in this year's process and, and beyond. I think, I think it also offers the same kind of uh, information resource for the community at large. And certainly interested citizens, uh, people, who are, people who are interested or following this process, yeah, I, I think by, by looking at this document can give everybody a common framework for how we review this. I think the last thing I'd say, I, I, as, I, as I think about it and, and look at it, uh, I think it's also a tool if you will, that we can use in the long term. I, I think it's going to work really, it's going to work well for this year, but I think it's kind of a living document, if you will. I think to the extent it's discussed uh, and uh, individual parts of it are discussed, it can be reviewed, it can be revised, uh, it can be added to, and I can I could envision that uh, in successive years as we go forward, something like this would be really helpful for the budget committee to have kind of a common platform. So I I guess that, that's kind of my summary. I would, uh, it's a lot, it's a lot of material. I would recommend that you, you know, do your best to in the next couple of months to wade through it or at least get comfortable with it because I think it'll be helpful to us as we go through this process. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Ken, for that overview. So I'm gonna invite uh, Jen Bell to come up and probably best places over there next to John. And I just invited Jen to come as one of the community members who participated on the FIT team to, uh, in a just a, a little bit shorter version, closer to maybe five minutes, just give us a sense of, as a, as a community member, uh, what you, tell the process, your insights, what you took away. Okay, is this, this is on, correct? Okay, yes. good. Um, so I was definitely one of the newbies um, on this kind of committee and um, I appreciate that opportunity. I think that was one of the things that came out of this that, you know, we, the group got beyond the usual suspects and um, we learned from people like John Borofsky, who's like a budget wizard, um, <laughs> you know, and to keep bringing people in and educating new people on how these things work and the different um, sort of options we have, I think was really helpful. So. I appreciate that. Um, one suggestion that I would make for future, because I, I tend to facilitate groups, focus groups, panel discussions, that kind of stuff, so I think about this. Is this echoing for everyone as much as it is me? You're hearing yourself through yeah. the speakers. Dang, that's loud. Okay, I'm glad we didn't I'm have these. Get used to it. Oh, okay. Everybody okay. does that, though. I am not, I am not used to it, okay. Um, so one of the suggestions up front would be to think about um, making it really clear that we're there to answer the could question and not the should question. And I think when you put people together, often people who are used to making decisions in their place of work or whatever it is, and you say, here are some things we immediately want to say, you should do that one, you know, and that's what we're used to. Um, I looked back at the initial kind of framework that we were given to see if I made that up entirely and, and the way it was described is we were there to evaluate options. And evaluation to me sounds kind of should. Um, so really focus on could and I think we got better. We got much better at that and quicker at the matrix. All right, what else? Um, I think, uh, you know, also I work in branding and going through this process I think it would be difficult for anyone who comes in thinking there's so much government waste and there's all this extra money to sit through these conversations and look at the creativity that the city and the city employees have, you know, put into the process. And I mean, it's definitely impressive. Um, I walked away thinking, you know, wow, they have really 
been creative and thought through how to how to cut from the budget so I think just from a branding perspective I was like they're pretty impressive um, that's about all let's see Anybody has any questions? Great. No, thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you, Jen, and I know we have a couple other community members out in the audience who participated as well as others who may be watching or listening. Um, obviously, thanks to the budget committee members who participated as well, but huge thanks to these community members who uh, were asked to do this. It was a lot of time. It was a lot of rapid learning curve and really appreciate the time attention and thought that you put into doing this for your community. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and so I wanted now to give the other budget committee members who were part of the FIT team each uh, just three minute opportunity to share uh, any additional thoughts about the process or what we accomplished. And then we'll have an opportunity for anyone else to ask some questions. So Councillor Brown, I'll start with you. Thank you. Um, well, I missed uh, one and a half meetings, and I uh, read the material that was published after those meetings. Uh, I, I want, too, wanted to thank the uh, citizens who participated in this, and I want to thank staff for, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good, thorough presentation and background information. I, I just want to make a couple of comments. I. Um, the criticism would be, I believe there was a general reluctance on the part of, in the presentations, staff presentations, to change anything. In other words, there were more arguments, not all of which I regarded as valid. I won't, I mean, we're not going to spend the time now going over each, each program and um, they'll come later. Um, but I, I believe that some of the arguments were, um, used uh, very debatable points to support their point of view. And specifically, I'll just mention, you know, like the use of the telephone, telecom funds, facility reserve funds, sunsetting the riverfront urban renewal district. I noticed a lot of really uh, questionable arguments on eliminating the MUPTI program, uh, which I don't support right now anyway. Um, so I... It, it, my fear is that we're not going to change anything. We're going to ignore all of the lessons of last spring and when we had the big debate. And we'll end up changing nothing. And the same list of things to be cut will be presented. And I, I, I just see a trend here of, of no support for changing anything. And um, that that disturbs me, and um, so I guess that's it. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I have a. I, I want to thank uh, all the citizen members as well as the budget committee members that took the time out to um, uh, go through this exercise. I was able to attend three meetings. Uh, I couldn't attend the last two, but. Um, followed the last two meetings as well. So I, I really think that this exercise gives not only us as a budget committee, but the entire community the opportunity to see what I believe, a little different from, from uh, Councilor Brown, what the facts are in terms of what our budget situation is, what we can do, what we can't do, long term as well as short term. And I think it's important as an exercise because um, just going into the outreach meetings at South Eugene and the one that I attended over at North, we had a smaller crowd there, um, I think it would help if this information were able to connect with the regular citizens that are out there because there's a large urban myth that you know there's significant fat left to be cut in the budget i don't believe in that myth i think that um, by going through this process we see that there is not a lot of fat to be cut there may be some things that we can do differently some things that we can do um, possibly to close some of the gaps that we have 
but on balance, I believe the that the work that staff has presented us and the work that we did in the FIT team is uh, very credible, very valid. So I would say that our job now is to really communicate with the public and to try to get people to understand exactly what our situation is and that we're not making things up and that we're not um, you know, speaking in fairy tales about what this, this budget is and what the realities we're going to face. Either we're going to have some very, very deep cuts, um, program cuts, or, you know, um, we're going to find a magic pot of revenue someplace, which I doubt will happen. So um, I, I think this is going to be a real difficult, difficult process, and I really appreciate what we were able to go through in the uh, fit team. All right, thank you. Chelsea. I also want to thank the city staff and all the citizen members, um, everyone who participated. I think we had some really great discussions throughout. I think one of the goals that we made, or at least that I made in our, I think it was our July workshop, was that we tried to be more transparent in everything we do as a budget committee. And I think this made a huge step forward in that regard. We had a base of what, 10 people who were there who really got to ask a lot of questions. And those people touch a lot of other people in Eugene. I think they were specifically chosen for that reason. So I think we've got s some new, maybe advocates isn't quite the right word, but some new people who are very engaged in the process. I also think that the matrix is very easy to read. Uh, at least for me, I think I could go through this even if I weren't involved in, and have an idea of, of why we made that choice or didn't. I know that it didn't have any impact on the general fund, for instance, so maybe that's why we didn't do it. I think it went, I'm very encouraged with how far we got in terms of improving our transparency. I think a challenge that we're going to continue to face is that this process was almost entirely supported by city staff. I know there was one FIT member in particular who kept on coming back to, we need an outside auditor, we need an outside person to look at this. And I don't personally have an issue with the city staff leading this. I think they are honest and truthful as much as they can be, but I think if, I heard this at the public meeting I went to as well, the budget public meeting, that as long as city is involved in evaluating these decisions, we can't, they can't be trusted. So I think that's just a challenge we're going to have to continue to face and think about how we can present information. Um, I think that this presents the information in a new way, which is also very encouraging, and we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, non-general funds and I found that that uh, matrix is also very helpful and I wonder if we can continue to try and see things in different ways if that will help us come up with new ideas just presenting it in a different way helps so much to see things differently overall I think it was a great process and I think it will help us moving forward I like what Ken said about this being a living document I think each year as we come up with new ideas it'd be helpful to put it into this framework thank you Marty um, thank you. I thought it was a <clears throat> sorry. I get to hear myself back up now too. Uh, I thought it was a good vehicle for um, evaluating, summarizing the staff viewpoints, and basically eliminating some of the possibilities um, that you know people came up with in good faith, but um, didn't necessarily understand sort of the, the Jenga puzzle. I think as Councillor Evans calls it, of of how things fit together. Uh, you know, you can eliminate uh, leaf pickup, but then you have a problem with your Clean Water Act permit. Well, it's not immediately obvious, but that is uh, something. An, one example. I think it was easier to make real progress in the context of those meetings in the sense that, no offense to anyone here, but this is a really big table <laughs> with a lot of people around it. Uh, and so it was a little easier to sort of evaluate and process. Um, there was, I thought, some frustration that no recommendations were asked. Um, and so if I had a suggestion, it would be that we complete this public feedback process we're working on right now and then ask the fit members if they'd be willing to continue to serve and come back here with a recommendation uh, on cuts, a long-term approach, and a bridging strategies to get from here to there. Um, they are just recommendations. We're not, you know, delegating. But I think that would be the people who looked at all these things would be able to pick some out and really pick the best winners. I'd probably also use them as a vehicle. I mean, we've talked about a revenue committee before. I would use them as the core of that, starting with um, and probably use a starting point, the meeting the challenge task force report from a few years back, and <coughs> update that. And then I think you'll have a clean recommendation for a way forward. But 
that's be how I would use it in the future and how I thought of it. Thank you. So we have about 20 more minutes in this part of our agenda tonight. So um, I wanted to open it up for questions or comments. And I have Councillor Taylor first in the queue. Thank you. Um, I just saw this tonight. I haven't read it all. But on, You're not under, expected to have read all of it, yeah. No. <laughs> under Terminate the Urban Renewal Districts, I see something that really puzzles me. It says on the bottom of page 33 of this that for 4J's local option levy, terminating the urban renewal districts will reduce school district revenues. How could that happen? It's a little complicated, but um, the uh, 4J local option levy, the portion of that that gets um, that gets uh, diverted to the urban renewal district as a result of the tax increment dollars um, doesn't count against the school's five dollar cap right so that then allows more properties to pay more of their local option levy tax to the school district and um, the tax assessor did an analysis and uh, determined at that time I can't remember the number of properties, but the, um, there was a fair number of properties that would um, be able to pay more local option tax because that urban renewal tax increment dollars went into the general government category instead of the schools category. Um, I think I'm still confused, but I, I know that part of the that the urban the schools would get more money, not necessarily our local schools, but schools in general, if we didn't have money diverted to urban renewal. And, um, but that's, I'm confused by that, saying they would get lose money if we terminated the urban renewal district. And I, I agree with some things that George said, that, that there's a reluctance to even consider some things, like reduce, getting rid of Mufti. There is there are arguments against getting rid of it that we I, I read here quickly that um, we it would uh, reduce our if we didn't have this tax exemption we wouldn't be able to pursue our goal of um, of uh, intense development in the center of town I think that we've been giving tax exemptions to people who are doing it obviously to make money and for not very good reasons and. Um, I, I think that's we should look at that again. The Mufti, the multiple unit property tax exemption. Thank you. Thank you. So before I go to the next person in the queue, I just want to provide a little clarity around next steps because it may help you frame your remarks at this point. So the next steps uh, at the end of tonight is I'm hoping everyone will take this report home and really spend some time reading it and that you will email me with any parts of the report that you would like to explore further or areas where you have additional questions and that will help us frame some an agenda for a future meeting where we will dive in in more detail so just wanted to frame that as we go forward because i guess there will be questions and you will have areas i assume that you want to dig into further so just wanted to clarify the next steps there so i have councillor Pryor. thank you um this is, this is really good work um, from the standpoint of what you tried to do, which was to create, I guess, a neutral, uh, unbiased information piece. Um, and I think you, the, the desire to try to take the should out of it and make it what is possible to do, uh, I think, was, was a very worthwhile thing. And therefore, we can use this as a baseline for what will be an extremely difficult um, process. But this will only provide us with part of what we need to make that process work because the aha for me is we're not just cutting money. Every single budget item that we're talking about cutting is associated with a set of values. Um, if the city does 50 things, each of those 50 things is associated with a value that this city wants to accomplish, whether it's public safety or whether it's anything else, they're, they're, they're fitting a set of values that we've decided are important. So when we talk about cutting something, we're not just cutting the money, we're actually talking about what in some people's mind is abandoning something that we value. And so which values do, will we choose to abandon 
um, and which values will we support. So we're really talking about taking the money away from something that we consider less valuable than something else. And I know that's really a hard way to put it, but that's what we're struggling with. Because if it was just dollars, we'd figure out a way to cut it. But every time we talk about cutting something, someone comes back with, oh, that violates my something that I hold valuable. And every single person around this table has a set of values that they look at this budget from. And I may have a set of values that would make it very easy for me to pick what to cut. And any other member at this table would have a value set that would make it very easy for them to make cuts. But the challenge with us and with the larger community is uh, we value every single one of these things. We value them all. And so trying to make the tough choice of which value is going to be great enough to keep and which value is going to be low enough to go is going to be the toughest part. And I'm talking all around this document because this document is the facts on which to do that. But the tough choice of deciding which cuts to make and the attendant values that will be reflected in that is still going to be the work for this table. And I'm hoping that the community's input is what is going to help us understand what their values are. I know they're going to be all over the map. This value, this community is extremely diverse in what it values. That's what we've been struggling with for years. But we will have to make value-based cuts, either that or come up with revenue. <clears throat> and I'm not sure if we will be able to do that or not. If we do, that will be great. We'll be able to retain as many values as possible. But we've got to use the next couple of months to look at this document and see, is there a way to try to limit the number of values that we have to cut as much as possible? Thank you. Councillor Brown. Um, I just had a, I'm going to save most of my questions until I have a chance to thoroughly digest this whole thing, especially the parts that I missed, the, the meeting and a half that I missed. But I do have a, a question for Sue Petzler George, just a quick follow up on, on um, Councillor Taylor's question about um, the, the 4J getting uh, $100,000 less if we terminated. Is that those those funds not go directly to 4J? They they go to the state, the ODR. No, the, the 4J gets two different um, kinds of property taxes. The one is the property taxes from their permanent tax rate. I see. Those dollars go basically to the state pool, and then um, 4J yeah. gets um, you know a certain level of revenue back from the state. Um, the second pot is the local option levy. Those are outside of the state school funding formula. So every dollar that 4J gets from their local option levy is a dollar more in revenue to them. I see. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure I'll have other questions later. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, my Mayor. Um, just a couple comments. Um, I, thank you for that back up to make room for everybody. I'm not near the mic. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that I think what staff has tried to do in this process is present the trade-offs. How you interpret those trade-offs is up to you and based on your own belief system and the way you look at things. And in terms of things like MAPTI or urban renewal, those come back to actually a policy decision by council. And so, um, it's sort of that thing about trying to tell you the pros and cons, hearing from council what they will support and not support, and then given that, um, how that affects the budget, I think is the, sort of the circle of, of the conversation. And um, the, um, the thing about trust, it, it seems to me that um, the whole exercise here was supposed to be about trying to, to the best of their ability, this committee saying, I trust the information. Not, I have not made a judgment about what to do with that information, but I trust the information. And I also would say that if people have, um, as the community gets to digest this, if they have questions, is there a place that, that they can still send their questions to, to, to get them answered about things that are in here. 
Mayor, we don't have a formal um, place set up yet, but one of the things I was going to share, and we can work on doing okay. that, is provide an opportunity for people to submit questions. Uh, one of the um, things I was going to mention is that the FIT info um, was posted on our website this afternoon, and so that's another place where people can at least start looking at the information as well. So I would just, um, I know we'll have our own conversation, but I would really just encourage that as soon as we can, we because once you offer somebody something to look at, questions immediately follow and it would yes. it would in the vein that we've been going the next thing to me is that there be a place and an answer that comes from people uh, looking at, at this because they haven't been around the table so and of course uh, people can submit their questions to the city's um, general email and those get followed up but I think uh, we need to time. tell them John uh, just, uh, that's my comment is that okay we want you to look at this we want you to be engaged if you have questions here's so we'll post something on the website that where they can do it right now, and then if there's other options, we'll also post that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Surratt? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I appreciate the mayor's comments, um, and I really appreciate this work. I look forward to reading through this. Um, and I think the way, just, just the glancing at it that we've had at the table here, the, the format in which the information is presented, I think is very valuable. And I'll encourage folks out in the community to check it out on the city's website and, and look particularly at those things that might be ideas that you've had and, and think would be of value and, and ferret those out. There's a good table of contents. So you don't have to read every single page if you don't want to. Um, and then, you know, in respect to this trust issue, I just want to be uh, clear so staff provided the information to the committee but who filled out the matrix the committee members so committee collectively members mm -hmm. filled out the matrix and decided how to answer the questions within the matrix so it wasn't staff that filled out the matrix so I, I think it's important for us to you know be clear about where information is coming from and then how it's vetted so that was the vetting process as the mayor said you know how, how do we view this information and how does it fit into the context of what we're trying to think about and, and wrestle with. So I really appreciate this work and I agree with Ken that it can be uh, a process that we can carry forward into future years. So even though we're focusing on FY15, I think this type of exercise and, and endeavor has value for the city going forward and, and will make our budget deliberations uh, much more, uh, will deepen them and make them more valuable. And, and so I really thank both staff and uh, city councilors and volunteers who were part of this. Um, with the question about the urban renewal funds and how it relates to 4J, um, I, I understood that explanation, but I wonder if, uh, Sue, if we might be able to do some kind of pictorial representation of how dollars are funneled and what might change if urban renewal money is changed. That might help get a picture of what that means. Um, so that's just one suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. And thanks again to all the members of, of the FIT Committee. So again, please read this. We will come back to it. And if you have any specific questions or areas that you would like to make sure we spend a little more time on, please send me an email. So one of the things that came up uh, at different points in our budget committee process and that was also part of the FIT Teams process was around non-general fund funds. And so what we wanted to do tonight was give the staff a chance to present about some of that and then also allow the FIT team members to uh, share anything that they learned from the process of looking at those things. Well, we thought we'd um, start tonight with talking about the non-general fund funds as um, Laura mentioned, is it, is it not on or is it, is it just me? <laughs> is it me or is it? Oh, higher. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so one of the things that, one of the reasons that we decided to come back to this topic first tonight was that there was a lot of questions around the uses of the specific funds. Can they be used and what can they be used for? What are the legal restrictions that are attached to the different funding mechanisms? And as we touched on, there were three specific funds that we paid 
particular attention to based on the questions that were generated on the 23rd of July when we met with this group. Um, we spent more time talking about the parking fund, the telecom fund, and the fleet fund. And again, I, uh, th th I would ask you to take the time when you have it to refer to the information sheets. They do provide quite a bit of information. And tonight we're going to get more into the details about um, what the fund types are and give you a little bit more information about the matrix that was put together um, by staff to help um, def define that and help people have more information. So as mentioned um, by several of the members, the FIT team delved into the topics um, for this area last week. They div uh, a table was developed by staff and that's the one that you received. It's the um, kind of the legal size, the legal size document. And that's folded, yes. And in that document, there's uh, it categorizes them by f different fund type, and then the purpose of that fund, <coughs> and then the primary funding sources, and the expenditures associated, and then what the spending restrictions are. And the other thing that we really um, thought might be helpful just to as a reference point is to let you know where those are within your FY14 budget document. So the last um, column actually uh, gives you a place to go look for more information if you so choose to do so. After filling out the matrix, um, some of the two, two main conclusions on this uh, subject were that the ser there were service level trade-offs to using non-general fund for general fund purposes. As, as of right now, the program, the funding source has the dollars program to provide service, different service levels. The second thing that the team um, provided feedback for was to look for ways to shift general fund costs to non-general fund. And one of the key points or takeaways from that conversation was really that there had to be a nexus. Um, one of those we talk about a lot is the telecom funds and the nexus for what telecom dollars can be used for. So with that, I'm going to transition this to Sue. And Sue's going to talk about the types of funds, the kinds of funds, and the benefits and drawbacks for using non-general funds for other purpose. Okay. So uh, we have about 30 different reporting funds and about 100 different sub-funds. And the reason that we have funds um, is to promote stewardship of the public assets and to ensure transparency and accountability around the use of particular dollars. So if we had all of our government operations just in one big pot and reported that way, it would be really hard for people to understand some of what goes on. Um, so. Um, for instance, with the road fund, um, you know, people want to see the gas tax come in and then get spent on road projects. You know, if you just had one giant government operation, it would be really hard to kind of tease that out and see that those things were linked together. Um, and in some cases, we're actually required by law to um, account for dollars in a separate fund. And an example of that is our geo bond fund because, um, you know, voters approve. Uh, extra taxes to pay for bonds and um, state law requires us to actually show um, that those dollars are getting spent for those purposes that the voters approved. So we have six different kinds of fund types um, and those fund types are determined by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board or GASB. Um, the general fund is our discretionary fund. Um, it has, we pay for our, our main governmental uh, general purpose uh, operations, police, fire, libraries, planning, general administration out of that fund. Um, and we really have three pieces in that fund. The, um, the one that we talk about most often, often is the main subfund. We also have a cultural services subfund for the um, Holt Center, um, Cuthbert, and uh, uh, Jacobs Gallery. And then we have an equipment replacement subfund where we set aside dollars um, to pay for uh, equipment replacement like um, the library um, book moving um, machine um, is one as an example. Um, special revenue funds are uh, funds that are used to account for sources that are legally res restricted to specific purposes. Um, we've got S CDBG, Community Development Block Grant Funds, um, as an example, the Road Fund, the Telecom Fund, those are special revenue funds. Uh, debt service funds are where we pay for principal and interest on certain kinds of debt and the geo bond fund is, is the prime example there. Uh, capital funds, uh, we 
uh, use that to account for um, the resources to acquire or construct major capital facilities, but we can also account for that kind of activity in other funds. So um, we might uh, we do some capital out of a special revenue fund where we have the road fund. Um, so for us, the capital general capital transfer from the general fund goes into the capital projects fund. Um, we also have some SDC funds there and some of our some of our other transportation capital projects. Um, enterprise funds are like private businesses. Um, users pay a fee for those services. Um, examples are ambulance transport, airport, and parking funds. And the internal service funds are like enterprise funds, but the customers are the internal organization. So we would have uh, facilities, fleet, and health insurance are some examples of our internal service funds. Um, most of these funds have um, some sort of an operating or capital cost for that particular program, and they also may be saving up for larger periodic expenses, like fleet um, saves up for replacement of um, vehicles over time, um, and then we also <laughs> save up for equipment and technology replacement over time. Um, we also account for um, the facility replacement reserve as a way to sort of save up money over time for a large capital project. Um, that's in our internal service funds just because of the way accounting rules work. Um, so benefits and drawbacks from using non-general funds. Uh, a benefit would be maybe we could solve some of the ongoing budget gap. I mean, the hope is really that there's some sort of easy way that we could do that without having to um, uh, um, hurt something else. I think um, what the FIT um, group um, determined as they were looking through this is that there really is a trade-off. So if you divert dollars from one purpose, then um, then you have a hole in in how you pay for that that purpose or that service. Um, so there's there's trade-offs that come with it, moving any of those dollars around. Um, for funds that derive their revenues from user fees, um, so mainly those enterprise and internal service funds, there are challenges with diverting dollars away from those. Um, funds. So if a user pays money for a particular service, they expect that you're going to use that money for that service. And so when we're looking at those kinds of funds, we, we just need to think about those trade-offs. Um, and then um, I guess I would also say that uh, um, when you start moving dollars um, between funds, and blurring that line between what's a general sort of unrestricted dollar and what is a restricted dollar set aside for a particular purpose, that really makes our accounting system less transparent um, for our stakeholders to be able to understand what's going on. So that would be a, a drawback from um, trying to find ways to use non-general funds for general fund purposes. Okay, um, and before, we'll, we'll be happy to go back and answer any questions that you have about the information in the matrix, but before we do, I just wanted to share with you a little bit of some of the information that we shared with the FIT about how the staff team has been looking at ways to use non-general funds for general fund purpose uh, where there is a nexus or an ongoing you know, potential savings. And so I think that one of the things that is key to think about when looking at non-general funds to help solve the budget gap, so we have an ongoing budget gap that we need to fill. So thinking about that in the context of the one-time versus ongoing and being clear about what, what it is that you're wanting to achieve by using a, diff a different source of resources. So some of the ways that we use non-general funds to generate ongoing budget solutions or some one-time fixes. Um, where we um, extended the life cycle of our fleet. Um, we did that in fiscal year 10 and uh, saved about $160,000. We do things like uh, risk and health care, what we call rate holidays. Um, and so what that, what that is is at the end of a fiscal year, if we're having better than projected experience, we um, forego some of the rates that were planned and have a, collect that savings back um, to the general fund and also to the non-general funds um, to capture those savings. Um, another source of uh, one-time solutions is that we use telecom to pay for general fund equipment and sometimes one-time telecom infrastructure. Um, EPD would have been an example of that and the infrastructure that was needed for that facility. But it's, you know, these are one-time solutions or one-time uh, opportunities that we've had to use some of those dollars. Um, the other thing that we did is look for ways to use general fund uh, ex 
to pay for general fund expenses from non-general fund resources by um, using telecom dollars. One example of this is that we uh, decided, I can't remember which fiscal year off the top of my head right now, but to pay for phone related costs um, about to the tune of about $450,000 a year out of the telecom fund. And that was a, a budget strategy uh, that was employed a few years ago. And what that did, that uh, was spread across all funds, but it um, helped us lower our general fund operating costs. Downtown police, you probably heard us talk several times about downtown police being paid for from the parking fund transfer. And then we shifted some, um, I want to emphasize some uh, parking maintenance costs to the stormwater fund where there was a nexus and there was a, it was an appropriate way to, to use those funds to do that. Another uh, place where we shifted some costs from the general fund was uh, to the construction permit funds to better align the funding with the types of services um, being provided. And then another one that you've heard quite a bit about is shifting uh, general f costs from the general fund to the cultural services subfund to pay for the major maintenance of the Holt Center. And I believe that over three years, not three years in a row, but I think that uh, is to the tune of about $300,000. And then other ways that you've heard us um, talk a little bit about using non-general fund is to pay for the additional <laughs> services currently funded out of the general fund by looking at a way to expand the use of you know the resources that come into that fund to make it appropriate to do so and so uh, we had had some conversation about that with council I believe last year um, is an opportunity to pay for use stormwater for parks maintenance um, but there would again had to have been expanded use of those dollars um, or of the um, the policy around how those dollars are used to do something like that so those are just um, some of the categories of things that we went over when we talked with the fit and we'd be happy to um, turn to the matrix in addition to Sue and I being here to answer your question we also have other um, fund experts available to to help answer your questions as well but I do think that um, this ended up the tool that we put together as a result of your recommendation is actually going to be something that will serve the organization well when we went back and started looking through the budget document a lot of this stuff was in there but it wasn't, or information was in there, but it wasn't always easy to find because it wasn't all connected. And so I hope that you find this as helpful as we have. Thank you. Any uh, FIT team members who would like to add anything to that before we open it up for questions? Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't want to insult the staff because I think they did a good job. But I, there were, a lot of these funds have statutory restrictions that are beyond our control. I get that. Um, but for instance, the telecom fund is restricted in our own ordinance. So that is sort of a self-inflicted restriction. And um, when we talked about that in the FIT team, the staff weighed in against removing those restrictions because they said, you know, the telecom companies would object. And there's been extensive litigation about it. Well, everybody objects to paying taxes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, without them, we don't have civilization, though. So, the Ashland restaurant tax goes to open space and wastewater treatment, not particularly related to the restaurant business. I mean, we have lots of taxes of lots of activities that go to things that aren't directly to what they were done. So, I think the deeper reason on the telecommunications funds is we use those funds for capital improvements. Uh, I don't have a problem with repurposing them, at least going forward, um, if we change the ordinance, which I think is probably advisable. Um, yeah, industry may object, but I don't know that they have a legal leg to stand on. You know, flip that with the parking fund. There was just talk about generating more money from out of parking and using parking funds for general fund purposes. Well, what we heard there was there's this huge backlog in road maintenance. So you probably could get more money, especially in the university area, out of parking. Uh, I wouldn't do downtown, but you know, whatever. That's a personal preference. Um, you could uh, make more money on that. But you should probably put it to that because maintenance can't wait. I think the improvements can, and so personally, I would say I think that is something we should look at because that's one of those sort of soft fenced funds as opposed to a hard fenced one, and it is one that we could look at purposing. So. Great, thanks. All right, we'll open it up for questions. I'll start a queue if anyone has any questions or, or comments, I guess. Yes. Councilor Taylor. This is for the city manager, I guess. 
could we, or the legal department or whoever, but could we change the ordinance about the telecom funds and divert that money to general fund? Uh, you can change any ordinance that's a city ordinance. There's other issues with the telecom fund. Uh, there's some outstanding litigation right now around some telecom dollars. And so while I understand that the telecom industry may not like it, uh, they also have the ability to try to do something about that and have and are in the process of doing that. So uh, we have some concerns with that. Uh, we also would have some concerns in recognizing um, I'm a bit, uh, I'll be risk adverse in some of these conversations, but um, the worst case scenario is we lose all our telecom money because of some uh, lawsuit that gets uh, filed if, in fact, we, um, I would say, use telecom money that's uh, not particularly a close nexus. So could we change the ordinance? Yes, the city council has the power to change any ordinance that's a city ordinance. Uh, but we would want to have more conversation before we choose to do that, just so everybody understands all uh, the risks associated with that. Thank you. Great. Councillor Brown. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the manager. Um, the telecom funds uh, that will be available are approximately $2 million. As far as we know, is that, am I close there? We receive about $2.9 million annually. In okay. And and currently that is posited as a possible uh, source to go to the facility reserve to build the first portion of the new city hall. Is that it's a possible idea of, of going from wherever we are seven or eight million up to fifteen? Yeah. Well, we're uh, as part of the city hall project. There will be telecom infrastructure in that project and okay. so the use of the telecom money is an appropriate use for those telecom infrastructure similar to 300 country club for the police there was telecom infrastructure there which we did spend telecom dollars for that <coughs> all right i guess i guess the question for for us and as budget committee members and and city councilors is 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 it that an appropriate use during a during a budget crisis and could it perhaps be, um, you know, more broadly purposed to help bridge that $5 million budget gap. And I don't really expect to have a conversation now. But I, and is it, is it anticipated that the total amount would be used at the City Hall? <laughs> I, I realize there haven't been any engineering estimates submitted yet. but No, we wouldn't use all of it. It would just be a small portion of it, just enough to cover what is appropriate for infrastructure and the telecom-related activities that would be associated with that facility. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Surratt. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just had a suggestion to maybe help call out some of the, particularly under the spending restrictions for the different <coughs> funds. I mean, if you look into the details, we can see some of them are easy, easy to identify, state law restricts or federal law restricts. But for the ones that are um, city ordinance um, <coughs> or policy, I think this is a really valuable matrix. I think it could be made a little bit more valuable by either calling out that, that detail um, and so we can understand where these places are that, that council might have um, some purview to, to consider changes, understanding. <coughs> and, and I think having the information about pending lawsuits or lawsuits that are in the pipeline, I think that's valuable information as well if, if you can find a way to stick it into this. The one place I see a reference that I have no idea what it means is in the risk and benefits fund restriction Bullet point two says expenditures from the risk sub fund are limited under EC 2.585. Uh, I don't know that there's a reference to what EC stands for. So, Eugene Code. Yeah, so there, I don't know if there's any other place that EC is referenced and we would know what that meant. So any kind of um, more clarification around those pieces I think would be helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? For the staff or thoughts? I, I would have found it helpful to have a column that would be like the general, would have found it helpful to have a column that was the, the general dollar amount we're talking about for each one of these funds. Because I mean, some of these are orders of magnitude more than others. So if we're 
just looking at this, that, that would help me out a lot. Anything else that would be helpful in our understanding of these funds and what would be useful as we look at these as options? Councilor Zelenka? Yeah, I've done a similar things for in my professional life and, and have put, used a, um, a uh, road signal type mechanism where you do green, yellow, red. Red meaning state law prohibits you from touching this fund. Yellow means you could, maybe it's an ordinance change or something like that. Green means it's unfettered. And that might be an easy way to color these that way so you can get a real, that would help what you were talking about, Claire. And also I like the idea of having a column in there that has the amount of the fund because some are, are really small and some are gigantic. I, I, I want to thank you. Sorry, I, I want to thank you for uh, bringing up the red, yellow, green. Because one of the things I didn't mention is that when we reviewed this information with the fit, we also talked about the fact that many of these funds, or several of these funds, from time to time, are in a cautionary or, you know, a, a place that we also need to worry about. So there's that status as well as um, whether or not there's, you know, a lot of restrictions. So. And of course, a red, yellow, or green will be. Our assessment of red, yellow, and green it may not <laughs> comport with everybody else's assessment red, yellow, and green, which would make a good conversation. It's okay. But the, the red ones would be clear. I mean, if it's state law that says you can't touch this one, that one's pretty clear. I mean, you can argue about whether or not it's a light yellow or <laughs> <laughs> right. really vibrant yes, yellow. Yes, there are. <laughs> I think the, the red will be pretty clear. The yellow, green, green we may differ on. Right. Potentially. So we can. But that's fine. Work. That's fine. Still so, useful so to watch it. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there would be some value in updating the matrix, which I think we can take away as a to-do. Any other thoughts? Anything that would be valuable? This is meant as a tool for us as a committee as we look at other options. Yes, Mayor? Somewhere there's a mic. Oh, yes, there is a mic. Okay, you got it? Yeah. I was going to suggest that you maybe think about was in the FIT report and in this, if there are issues that anybody around the table has uh, around trust, I think rather than it being put on being staff or not staff, it would be far more helpful to say, what do you need to have confidence that this is the correct information, and then try to figure that out so we lay that kind of conversation to rest. Comments there about anything else that would be valuable for you as budget committee members? in understanding or having trust in the information. Okay. We may have an early night. We'll run meeting. No, no complaints, huh? Okay. All right. If that's it, we are adjourned. For, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Polling. I want to remind the public about the upcoming public outreach we're doing next. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. We have, we have had three of our five community budget meetings. Uh, thus far, and we have two more this coming week, and they are, thank you, Willamette High School tomorrow evening and Churchill Wednesday evening. All of them are at 6 p.m., 6 to 8 p.m. So we encourage anyone who is interested in learning more and participating, sharing their thoughts and feedback to attend. Thank you. We are adjourned. Right. Can you get a lovely no.